but maybe yeah. some, uh, with the other possibility is, is the idea of a, a transcendent identity though maybe well you know I, I would have to look at where kind of these you know who is who is arguing for this transcendent identity how are they kind of imagining it what are they thinking it might be uh, what does it mean for are these are these kinds of identities being uh, coming? Where where are they coming from? Whose interests are they serving? Are the questions I would be asking for right? Aboriginal people are not asking for this kind of transcendent identity. For me, my politics are very clear about you know where I would situate my support. Uh, so I would really I, I would I would want to know what these identities how they are be, the, how they are being Im imagined and whose interests I think they might end up serving within the context of the history that I'm outlining here. But I guess um, I'm curious about like the state form then. Is the state form almost seems like always always already uh, problematic? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I, with that, I would agree. Mm -hmm. um, are you, are you uh, wearing out, Sonera? Are you OK? No, I'm OK. Oh, you're good, I'm OK. Can I ask you what, uh, another question? Are you going to be up? No, go ahead. Um, I want to ask you, and this is a question when you mentioned Humani Banerjee, I, I believe I asked her the same question. Whenever, whenever I'm working with someone uh, and reading the work of someone who looks at race, <coughs> class, and gender, and this axis of oppression, as we call it, um, the que can we hierarchize pain? Um, if you had to choose one of the categories of that axis, mm -hmm. does one hurt humanity more than another? You know, I don't think you can hierarchize pain. I'm, I'm not a believer in kind of this hierarchy of oppression. I don't, I don't believe that. But there, is, there are certain claims that cannot be treated as, you know, as similar to other claims. So for example, in, in Canada, like I wouldn't have a hierarchy of oppression. I wouldn't have a hierarchy of pain. But I would make a clear distinction between the claims of Aboriginal peoples and the claim of any other group, including mm -hmm. immigrants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a clear difference yes. there, right? So I wouldn't, it's not a hierarchy of pain. It might be, part of it is a hierarchy of pain. Because yeah. the genocide of Aboriginal peoples in this, on this continent is at a scale that, you know, um, or if you look at, you know, the, the, the uh, enslavement of black people, right? right? right. That is a, a historical experience. But then, so, so it's, uh, you know, I don't want to fall into the trap, but in right. terms of political claims, mm -hmm. I think there clearly is a hierarchy. It's not a hierarchy of pain. It's not a hierarchy of oppression. It's clearly shaped by that. Right. But the claims of Aboriginal peoples to me to this territory are different from yes. the claim that any other group can make. So yeah, I, I fully agree. I, I, my question is more about, like, I, I fully agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But let's look, for example, at us. We're both women. Yes. But I can pass, right? Yeah. So we're in line at Walmart. We're both returning a shirt. They don't ask me if I wore the shirt. They ask you why. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So m my, my axis is different from yours. Yes. And so my question is um, the fact that I'm a woman Sometimes I'm, I'm not in a privileged group, but the fact that I can you generally pass as white, I, I have access to white privilege. Um, so am, I guess what I'm saying is, do I, do I know what it's like to feel the pain of being a woman and a visible minority and working class? Mm. Not really. I can pass in two, mm. right? Mm. So um, that's what I mean by my, my question being like, I, I, because I can pass in one category, I, is there if I was uh, if I was a, a South Asian man mm -hmm. versus a white woman, would I have a different? Would I have more access to power every day? That, I guess that's what my question is. Mm -hmm. The everyday lived experiences when one doesn't have that access mm -hmm. of oppressions, all three groups. Mm -hmm. um, is there is there a choice mm -hmm. that you would make? Mm -hmm. Or I guess you can even think of it in terms of full citizenship, right? Sure, sure. Well, not really, because the exalted subject, the male, there's female white privilege too, right? Yeah. That's what I'm we're talking about with the Walmart scenario, mm -hmm. is that because I can pass every day as, as having a, the right socioeconomic level and having the right color of skin, the fact that I'm a woman doesn't really matter so much. 
it does matter with Sunira because part of the outrage against you was not only that you were an immigrant, but that you were a female yeah, as well. That's right. There's no <laughs> doubt there, right? Yeah. And, and I think we're watching that with the election in the United States right yes. now. Yes. There's no doubt that Hillary Clinton, as a white woman, yes. is in a better power group than uh, Obama. Yes. Or in a more oh, power. no, there's no question about yeah. that in my mind. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. so. Mm -hmm. so I guess in yeah. a way we can, right? We can say that, that gender trumps race. Well, in some respects. I, mm -hmm. I can't say that. I can't say that. I can't say gender trumps race. Mm. I can't say not that. Not in all? Really. Not in all? No. Uh, no, I can't. Not in all. You know, I would have to really look at the particular situation. And I mean, that's, that's the kind of, that's the importance of anti-racist feminists and the concept of intersectionality, mm. right? Yeah. That, you know, that there aren't absolutes, right? You have to look at this intersection and, and it, you know, the, the kind of context, the specificity and, and the power relations within that particular situation are very, very important. Mm. So, you know, I, I can't take this gender trumps race or, you know, I can't take that kind of position right. for that me. That would be hierarchizing. Yeah, pain. it would be. For me, you know, kind of context, power, and history are, I ha you know, th those are key to understanding, um, you know, any particular example or instance that we might be talking about. I can't, I can't take a, a, a position uh, like, you know, gender trumps race. I can't. Mm, yeah. power, in some instances it does, awesome. in others it won't. Right. So, yeah. And you can open it to the floor if people wanted to. Yeah. You, you, you have an opportunity to speak to Dr. Tobani as well at the round table, but if you like to, if you're right with that, yes, if anyone yes, would like yes. to ask a question. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz was recently at Laurentian University, uh -huh. and I heard her talk, the really interesting talk. But one of the things she said was that you can't possibly deal with trying to bring about fundamental social transformation unless you deal with the origin myths of the particular context in which you're dealing with. And it sounds to me, and I haven't had an opportunity yet uh, to read your book, I'm, I'm obviously going to do that soon, but I was just wondering if you might want to talk a little bit about that. Yes. About the, I mean, this means all, yes. on all sorts of different fronts of trying to bring about radical social change. You mm -hmm. can't really bring it about without dealing with those origin mythologies yes. that lie at yes. the heart of Canadian state formation. Yes, yes. No, and, and I do do that. I do do that. I look at how, you know, kind of the, the, the kind of myth of innocent origins and how the Canadian kind of, you know, uh, and, and I refer to, I guess, the, the kind of latest particular uh, example I, I use is A People's History. Right, which was the big CBC production, which has now been translated in I don't know how many languages and continues to be shown. And and you know and the the way in which that history is told is, um, uh, I, I forget what the exact words are, but uh, you know a, a new land for a new people, right? Something like that. Something. It was like, celebrated you know, as being a very inclusive. history. It's a very inclusive history, right? So it's, it's really, I mean, I do look at kind of the master narratives of, of, of Canadian national origins and, and kind of, you know, debunk them. I, I suppose it would be interesting to say a little bit about how, uh, how I came to this project. You know, when I was president of NAC, um, for those of you who were in Canada in the 1990s, you might remember that, you know, <coughs> 1993, 96 is when I was president of NAC. And there was a, a complete kind of restructuring of social policy, of immigration policy during that period under the Chrétien government. And, you know, as, as president of NAC, I was representing NAC at the Immigration Policy Review. And I went to the Immigration Policy Review and the whole, you know, the whole immigration uh, program was being looked at. And it was primarily people of color, immigrant and refugee communities who were there uh, making presentations, talking about how detrimental uh, all of the proposals that were being floated would be uh, for immigrants in general, uh, and I'm using immigrants in a very racialized way, right, in, in the way it gets used to, to refer to people of color who might be citizens but still get constructed as immigrants. And those were the communities that, that were there. And then I would represent NAC at the, at the uh, SSR review, the Social Security review. And the room would be, you would have very few women of color in there. It was primarily seen as a feminist issue. We know women's access, you know, with the do, uh, cutbacks that we were experiencing to social assistance, childcare, 
the whole gamut of social programs. So it was a very white kind of a very white woman space. And for me, the two were so integrally connected. Hmm? And yet, it was very, very difficult to, to get the, the white women I was working with at that time to understand how they could take their access to citizenship so much for granted. And for them, citizenship was about the social entitlements of citizenship. And in the immigration policy review, the whole debate was around access to formal citizenship, right? Which was also being closed off for immigrant women. So that's how I kind of started this, this project. I wanted to look at citizenship in this larger framework, both in terms of immigration and, and of course, uh, all non-Aboriginal people's access to citizenship has been organized through processes of migration. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to look at. But then looking at those reviews and, and looking at, at, at the kind of discourse that was used and, and the kinds of constructs, it was very clear that there was a kind of Canadian national <coughs> who was being constructed. Who, and, and there were lots of similarities across both sets of reviews. And this national subject was the one who had to be protected from the encroachments on citizenship by immigrant outsiders, bogus asylum. I mean, the whole, you, 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 you're familiar with all of that. And that's how this project started. So really taking on the kind of, kind of master narratives of Canadian nationhood both historically and as they function today, was very much part of my project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Time is it? Oh. Anybody? OK. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tobani, because uh, we've gone on now for quite a while. And, um, thank you for wonderful <laughs> answers, a wonderful discussion. And thank you. Uh, yes. hope to see you throughout the conference, especially at your keynote. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.